not quite sure where to ask you to turn in your Bible tonight because I want to just, uh, I want to probably touch on a couple of, of passages. But I want to, uh, I really want to just share with you on the topic that I've called intimacy with God. The longer that you know Jesus as your Savior, the more you realize that the one thing that God desires of us more than anything else is that we come close to him, that we come to know him intimately. Someone said that human beings are incurably religious. God talk and human beings really go together. You know, there are what they call three monotheistic religions. But when Christians speak of the oneness of God, they don't mean the same thing that Jewish people and Muslim people mean when they talk about God's oneness. Christians believe that within God's oneness, there are personal differences there are persons that are different. In fact, listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 6. He says, but to us, there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. All four Gospels, and especially John's Gospel, reveal that Jesus is God and uh, that Jesus reveals God through his human life. In fact, in chapter 1 and verse 18, we are told that Jesus is the embodiment of God the Father. He is God in a human body. And he is the one that literally expounds God to us in his human life here on this earth. Jesus reveals to us not only who God is, but he reveals to us the purposes of God and the, and the desires of God. And if you follow Jesus's ministry, you look at him in those four Gospels, you're going to discover that the thing that God desires from human beings is an intimate relationship. Now that, to me, is significant. And that's what I want to focus our devotional thoughts on tonight. In fact, if you study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, what you discover is that there are three leading metaphors or pictures that uh, describe for us the, the desire of God to be intimately acquainted with us as human beings. The first one is probably the least of the three pictures of intimacy that God has with humans. It's what I would call monarchy. You know what a monarch is? <laughs> a monarch isn't a butterfly only. A monarch is a king. We, that, the, the whole idea of a monarchy system of government is foreign to us Americans. In fact, we, uh, our, our forefathers threw off the monarchy. They didn't want anything to do with the king of England. And uh, that's what the American Revolution, of course, was all about. But a monarchy involves a king. And in a monarchy, the king is not only sovereign, but he is also the judge. He has the final say about who lives and who dies, about what happens and what doesn't happen. So in a monarchy, the king is also the judge. He is not only sovereign, he has legal powers over the people of his kingdom. Well, if you study the Bible, you'll find that that ancient uh, Near Eastern metaphor of, uh, of a monarchy it just permeates the scripture. In fact, when God reveals himself to the people of Israel, 
he reveals himself as their king. He reveals himself as their monarch, if you will. He is their king. He is, of course, their judge as well. The political system, if I could call it that, of the nation of Israel is what we would call a theocracy. That is, the one that was in charge of the nation of Israel was Theos himself, which is God. It was a theocracy. It was God who was over the people of Israel, his people. And you can study throughout the scripture this subject then of a king and a kingdom. In fact, the human rulers of the nation of Israel were simply regents, were simply substitutes, if you will, for a time for the coming king, the Messiah himself. And kingdom truth runs throughout the Bible. And it concludes in the book of Revelation with the king on his throne, right? And all of humanity is gathered around the throne of King Jesus as he sits upon that throne and is worshipped by all his creation. A monarchy. That's the first picture of intimacy that we get in the, in the scripture. Uh, human beings are God's creatures, and as such, they have violated the law of God. And as a result of that, because God is the king and because God is the judge, because human beings have violated God's law, they are under eternal condemnation. But deliverance from that judgment, of course, has been provided by the king himself. Jesus, who is the king, who is the Messiah, he took the penalty of mankind upon himself when he hung on that tree on that cross. And in doing so, he totally satisfied the judgment of God. And by that, any human being that accepts Jesus' sacrifice on his or her behalf and places faith or dependence in Jesus is forgiven their sin and, of course, enjoys complete redemption from it. That's salvation. It's provided by the monarchy, by the king himself. Interestingly enough, even though Abraham did not live under the, uh, the theocracy of Israel, he was before that, he predates that. The monarchy metaphor extends way back to Abraham's time. And the New Testament in both the book of Romans and in the book of Galatians picks Abraham as a human model as a prime example of a human being living under a monarchy. But if you study the life of Abraham, what you realize is that he is not, uh, he is not primarily caught up with God's commands. Abraham is called the friend of God. He's a friend of the king. He's a friend of the monarch. He's not caught up with the laws of God. He's all about God himself. And this is the truth that Israel missed, and thus they rejected their king, their Messiah. In fact, the, the scripture says that as a result, they have stumbled over the Messiah. They've stumbled at Jesus, who is the stumbling stone. And uh, because they missed the truth, that it's not about the law that the, the Lord has given, but it's about a relationship with the God that gives that law. They have gone about substituting their own works, their own efforts, their own righteousness in order to keep that law and gain the favor of God when that's not the way that it's done. Abraham believed God 
and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. That's the bottom line. I remember telling a Jewish veterinarian that that I met in a, in a, in a gas station at a garage. We were having our car serviced, and we got talk. I found out he was Jewish, and I said, have you ever considered the fact that, uh, that Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, was justified, was considered righteous in the eyes of God, not because he kept the law, there was no law given yet, but because he simply believed God. He placed faith in God, and God counted that to him for righteousness. He hadn't thought about that. Neither has the Jewish people as a whole. They missed that important truth. It's not about the law. It's about the giver of the law. When you are in a relationship with him, you know what? He keeps the law in you and through you. But there's a second metaphor in the scripture, not only monarchy. This is a little, this gets you a little bit more intimate in relationship with God, even though Abraham was a friend of the king, he was a friend of God. The second metaphor that the Bible uses extensively is that of not only monarchy, but family. Family. In the Bible, God is pictured as a father, and human beings are his earthly family. From the very beginning in the book of Genesis, it's clear that God has set up a patriarchal society. He has put fathers in charge of families. It is their responsibility to care for the family. And in that ancient Near Eastern family life, it was the father's responsibility to even reach out and gather any prodigals or any family member that got marginalized and got disenfranchised from the family. He would take his resources and do whatever he needed to do in order to bring that one back into the family again, into relationship with the family. Well, that is a wonderful picture of exactly what God does with a human family. In fact, if you go back and check it out, you'll find that the father, when he was no longer able to do so, would pass that responsibility of care for the family onto the firstborn son. Israel is called God's firstborn. So is Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, called the firstborn. And uh, so he is the Son of God. Remember how the book of Psalms puts it? David, I think, is the author in Psalm 2, where God the Father speaks and says to Jesus, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee the nations for thine inheritance and the uttermost part of the earth. And so it is Jesus, the Son of God. Here's that family picture. He shares a unique relationship with the Father. And it is through Jesus, the Messiah, that uh, there is a family acceptance to all human beings who will believe who will come through Jesus, the Son of God, the eternal Son of God. He becomes the means whereby the children of men become children of God. And there is established a parent-child relationship between human beings and the God of heaven. It's an amazing picture. He, Jesus, is the Son of God, but you know what we are called? The sons of God. Small s. The sons of God. Through Jesus, we're accepted into that family that Jesus is the firstborn son of. We become his human family, and as such, we mirror the inner, the inner life of God himself. It's the way that God teaches intimacy that he seeks 
to have with us. We enter God's family through a birth. You know, all of us entered our biological family through a birth. We enter God's family through a new birth. And that new birth produces a new heart. And that new heart within us makes us new creations. And being a new creation results in a new life, a resurrection life. And that new life then makes us members of a new family. And we get to call God Papa, Abba, Abba. We get to call him Abba. And Hebrew says that we call Jesus our elder brother. He's not ashamed to be so identified with us that he is our, you know, you're my brother. Jesus is our elder brother. He's our elder brother. And we as brothers and sisters in the Bible are called brethren. We're brethren. We're all God's family together. And it and it, it's a picture of the intimacy that God wants to have with us. We're his kids. We're his family. He, he, he wants to He wants us to mirror his self-giving love and mingle our lives with other people and not be selfish. It's an incredible, intimate, personal relationship that we have with Jesus and with the Father through the Holy Spirit. But there's a third and a final metaphor of this intimacy with God that I want to talk about tonight. It's called matrimony. (laughs) It's the greatest intimacy that the Bible shows us. It's more intimate than a parent-child relationship. Did you know that when God led Israel out of Egypt in that exodus, and he brought them to Mount Sinai, that Mount Sinai and that cloud that that, uh, that, uh, represented the the presence of God was like a hoopah, a, a marriage canopy, over the people of Israel. And at Mount Sinai, God was taking his bride. And that bride was the people of Israel, the people of God. And in fact, in Jeremiah chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3, God laments the fact that the people of God, Israel themselves, they had forgotten the love of espousals, of, uh, of engagement that they had once with him. And God laments that you you no longer have that honeymoon love for me that you once had. And in in Isaiah uh, chapter uh, 62, and uh, listen to these verses four and five. Here's what God says when he's looking forward to the restoration of Israel that rebelled against him as a rebellious wife. Here's what he says. Thou shalt no more be called forsaken, neither shall thy land be termed desolate. But thou shalt be called Hephzibah, which means my delight in in Israel. My delight is in her. And thy land, Beulah. Beulah means married. God says, uh, the promised land that I'm going to lead you into, it's the married land. You remember how many times the prophets in the Old Testament accuse Israel of spiritual prostitution and spiritual adultery. Their rebellion in seeking other gods, their idolatry, that rebellion was not merely the breaking of the Ten Commandments, the legal law of God, but it was a breaking of the marriage covenant that God made with them. In Jesus' ministry, He was recognized as the bridegroom. John the baptizer, John the immerser. Remember when uh, they came to him and they tried to make him jealous because Jesus was having greater impact than John. And John says, no problem. (laughs) He said, uh, the bridegroom is the one that gets the bride. I'm just the best man. And I rejoice because the bridegroom is is, uh, coming and he's getting his bride. And so as the best man, I rejoice in that. And Jesus himself said when he was accused of not uh, 
taking time to fast with his disciples, Jesus said, my disciples are going to fast when the bridegroom is gone. When the bridegroom's here, we rejoice. But when the bridegroom's gone, we will fast. And so he recognized himself. The last picture of marriage in the Bible is in the closing chapters of the book of Revelation. There is what is called the marriage supper of the Lamb, the wedding feast, in which all believers from all ages are seated around the table of the bridegroom. And the, the, the bride now becomes the wife who's made herself ready. And uh, there is the, con the consummation of that relationship. Anyway, matrimony. It's a wonderful picture in the Bible, but it's a picture of the intimacy that God desires with every single one of us. This is, he, this is what he wants to communicate through this picture. You know, marriage, it's, it's something that you have a choice in. Even if the marriage was arranged, the, the young lady did not have to marry that uh, young man or that person. She could refuse it. Marriage is different because you can't determine your birth. <laughs> You can't determine your natural origin. You can't determine your citizenship or what family you might be born into. But marriage is a personal choice. And also, marriage is a covenant. Marriage is a loving, self-giving, covenantal commitment. It's a statement. You know, when God made human beings... Way back in Genesis 1.27, he said he made them male and female. You know, gender is an inescapable birthright. God distinctly made only two genders, male and female. And those two genders, male and female, are a sacred expression of the commitment of maleness or femaleness and thus the divine intention pointing to the creator himself. The fact is, the union that we call marriage is the bringing together of those two, male and female, into one. A union of two in self-giving love in which they share the same name, they share their bodies, they share their possessions. They share their vocations. They, they, they share common life together. It's, it's a total giving of themselves to keep themselves only for each other. And uh, for a married person to share his or her body with any other than their spouse is a violation of a sacred covenant established between them. God created sex or sexes or sexuality to make us male and female to convey the kind of relationship that he desires with us. That is a loving relationship, a self-giving uh, covenantal commitment. Marriage is a picture of Christ's love for his church and a close counterpart to love that's the inner life of the triune God. This is a, a huge thought that I've meditated on through the years, and that is before there ever was a creation, before there was ever anything else, just the triune God, they were in perfect love relationship, the three in one. They were in perfect... If there is not a triunity or at least a, a two persons of the Godhood, you, you can't have God being a God of love. Who would there be to love without uh, before creation? He is by his nature a God of love. And so there has been this deep love in the triune Godhead. And what marriage represents is that love between the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit that existed from all eternity. You know, marriage is more than an end in itself. It's really, Paul says, it's, it's a profound mystery. 
because it's a picture of Christ and his relationship with his people. We call the church. Marriage is an advertisement of God's redemptive vision for the whole world that's broken. That he wants to join together in an intimate self-giving union with himself. My wife is in the nursery, and so I can share this because she doesn't like when I talk about her when she's sitting here. Mm-hmm. On special occasions, sometimes it doesn't have to be special, but most of the time on special occasions, you know, I take time to sit down, and you probably do this too, to think and write something very meaningful to my wife. Uh, expressing my heart, love for her. And um, so, you know, I'm going through the, uh, I, I go up to the bedroom, you know, and there's what I wrote is up there right on the dresser, like, you know, to remind me or her, I don't know. But, but if I go in her top drawer, to maybe take some money out of the envelope she has in there. There are, there are all those, uh, those love notes, you know, that are meaningful to her that she has, she's kept, she's kept them. I have my little file too, but the fact of the matter is the reason we do that is because there is that, that sharing, that, that, that bond, that love, that union that is just special to a husband and wife. I mean, we can tell one another, you know, I love you, but we can, we never express the same kind of love to one another that we do as a husband and wife to each other. That's a special love relationship. God desires that kind of intimacy with us. I want to share just this, uh, this, illustration with you facts we're obsessed with our phones right a new study has found that the smartphone users click tap or swipe on their phone 5427 times a day according to a researcher the heaviest smartphone users okay well maybe you're not the heaviest well that's the top 10 percent of phone users Uh, However, the rest of us, we still touch the addictive thing 2,617 times a day on the average. That's not a small number. The um, the total, the the, the tool uh, tracked the user's interaction over five days all day. And by every interaction, we mean every tap, type, swipe, click touches, averaging out the numbers, the figures that I just gave you, the heaviest users are touching their devices a couple of million times in a year. Probably the most interesting thing in all of this was that all the people surveyed completely underestimated their phone touching. While they were initially shocked by the numbers, 41% said it probably won't change the way I use my phone. So my question to us tonight to think about how many taps, how many swipes, how many clicks, how many touches have taken place between you and the Lord today? And yet I'm telling you the truth on the basis of God's word, his heart yearns. He longs for nothing more than for you and him to be intimate.